This is something you can't miss. What's behind racing? What's the motivation? Because I like to race. That <laughs> sure is fun. <laughs> This will be a celebration of speed, past, present, and future. We are just outside of the Motor City of Detroit, Michigan. Welcome to the first ever American Speed Festival taking place at the M1 Concourse in Pontiac, Michigan. Welcome into this beautiful facility, everybody. Hi and welcome. I am Ralph Shaheen alongside Brian Loans. Brian, this is an amazing event, first time ever, and it's a little bit different than what maybe you've seen at other events because this racetrack here is, well, actually not even a racetrack because this is more of a high-speed driving yes. circuit yes this is uh this is going to be an incredible experience it's always great to be at an inaugural event especially one that's kind of breaking the mold for what we've seen other facilities and other really other events of this type bring we have cars from all over the world we have cars from through the history of racing and we're going to be seeing them on the racetrack making noise turning tires the way they should be it's going to be a fantastic weekend filled with food filled with wine and certainly filled with high performance driving it's really all about the experience of seeing these vehicles hearing these vehicles smelling these vehicles <laughs> because they all have different exhaust smells and tones and that's really what this is going to be all about. It is, and it's going to be celebrating the M1 Concourse, which is a really unique facility in this country. We talk about where and how this facility came to exist. Well, frankly, for more than 100 years, this was a, a site where automotive vehicles, trucks, buses, everything was produced. Back in the early 1900s, it was the Rapid Motor Company that then turned into GM Truck. And from 1908 to really 2008, this was a manufacturing facility. In 2011, the facility was handed over to the racer uh, group. 2014, the M1 concourse opens up 250 garages we're going to be telling you about it all weekend long and ralph we got cars on the racetrack making noise and we got hannah lopa good morning guys it is a beautiful day for these cars to hit the track but before we get started i wanted to introduce you to the ceo of m1 concourse tim mcgrain tim all of your hard work has led to the culmination of this moment the inaugural american speed festival what are you most looking forward to this weekend well, I think the the entire team are obviously excited about having this event. It was it was scheduled for last year. It got postponed, like most of last year's events doing. So now we're finally here, American Speed Festival at N1 Concourse. We've got a really diverse group of cars. Of the 70 entrants, you know, we range from you know, vintage Indy cars. We've got some late model supercars. There's obviously the iconic chaparrales. I think everybody's excited to see those on the track. Um, and then some really unusual things. The, the Henry Ford Museum are, are bringing over what they call the sweepstakes car. Uh, the original sweepstakes car is on display in their museum so this is actually sort of a, a replica but it, it's 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 done exactly the way the, the the 1901 car is so we actually see 1901 technology going around the track is going to be exciting all right hannah thank you it's always great to see tim well he's all about these these types of really cool events like this is a masterful job of putting them on this is a look at the circuit that we're going to have here this weekend. It is, and it is a great circuit. It's tight. It's 11 turns, a mile and a half, 30 feet wide, and there's a 30-foot elevation change throughout the course of the laps that we'll be seeing made. And as Tim told us, we're going to see everything from the most modern, high-performance supercars to a 1901 Ford's of sweepstakes car that he beat Henry Winton with. We'll talk about that when we get down to that part of the, uh, the, the event as well. And Ralph, we've got to welcome our third voice into the booth here. Yep, we're going to get to that in a second here as well. We, we've got all kinds of folks are going to be stuck stop them by and we're going to take a quick break here from the M1 concourse. The American Speed Festival on Speed Sport is brought to you by Reliable, vehicles taken seriously, and by Meguiar's. Every ride matters. Welcome everybody, it's Brian Loans and Hannah Lopa here in the paddock area of the M1 Concourse this weekend at the American Speed Festival. You'll see six different categories of cars on the course throughout the day. We're going to take you around the paddock right now and give you a little info on what each class is and what kind of cars are in them. 
So one of our categories is called feature or solo, and the feature cars this year are the chaparrales of Jim Hall. You can see them behind me. These cars will be on the racetrack independently of each other to get maximum exposure and get maximum enjoyment of viewing, noise, and performance. In our stock car class, we see everything from this 1952 Hudson all the way up to modern NASCARs. The vintage IndyCar class here at the American Speed Festival is incredible. Everything from the turbine cars of the late 60s to some of the roadsters that raced at the Speedway in the 1950s. It is a trip back in time from the Indy 500. Our endurance class features cars that have raced events like the 24 Hours of Le Mans and unique cars like this Mustang that have raced at the 24 Hours of Daytona in 1975. The supercar category here at the American Speed Festival features some of the highest tech, highest dollar, most exotic machines in the world, and these two Ferraris behind me are just a taste of what you'll see out in the racetrack. If there's one category that will literally bring the noise this weekend at the American Speed Festival, it's the thunderous Can-Am cars. From the 91730 Porsche behind me to the Shadow with its rockin' big block Chevy engine, everybody will be on the fence to watch these guys. Just a beautiful early fall day here in Michigan. It's a nice cool way to start the morning. It's going to be a nice cool day. Perfect, again, for getting drivers out there to put some laps in and not overheating anybody inside their race cars. Well, welcome back into our Speed Sport TV booth here. Nate Dyer at the far end. Brian Lone's right here in the middle, and I'm Ralph Sheen. Anna Lopa hasn't uh, joined us in the booth. She just ran in here a minute ago, grabbed some water, and headed back out. She was smart I, enough to leave. She's smart <laughs> enough to leave, yes. Yeah, she's looking for more interviews for you folks here today, and we're going to have a great group of guests oh and here comes the Devon man and I'm glad we're I'm glad we've, we've landed on the Devon nice and early here 59 Devon SS and you know Ralph you alluded to it but what unique cars these were and really ahead of their time you're talking about a car that was engineered in it was engineered in in Ireland Bill Devon was a hot rodder from California he was the bodybuilder but it was really the guys in Ireland that Noel Hills and Malcolm McGregor that that did the chassis work on these cars and like so many of these really cool, almost, you know, mashups of American horsepower and classic kind of English chassis, the business plan didn't go according to what they wanted to. Yeah, no, correct. But the thing about this car is it's been incredibly su successful racing throughout the decades, yeah. SVRA champion in more modern times, because, yeah, you're combining the big American horsepower, incredibly lightweight, and it just creates a really dynamic combination in, in this sort of lightweight racer. We have a really great mix on the course right now when we look at some of the Ferrari Challenge machines as we see one right now rounding the right-hander down there to lead to the back straightaway. When we took, you know, we talk about the sights and the sounds of this event, right now on the racetrack we have Ford GT that has a three and a half liter V6 twin turbo in it. We have the beautiful sounds of the Ferrari engines and of course, near and dear to your heart, the V10 growl of a Viper. A couple of Vipers that have been running out there. So there is that Ford GT we were talking about. And, you know, Ralph, we look at these supercars. You have sons. We both have sons about the same age. Yep. This is the stuff that's hanging on their wall. It is. <laughs> uh, well, what are you talking about? It's hanging on my wall. Uh, I mean, this is this is aspirational on every level, isn't it? The Ford GT. Uh, limited production, still making a few of them. Yes. We, well, it's not the only Ford GT we have here. We have a blue not. one, too, right? <laughs> We're well, doing, when you're in the home of Ford, exactly. you're going to have to have a few of them. We basically drive by the glass house in Dearborn to get to the facility here at M1 Concourse. And, you know, the, one of the neatest things to me about these cars was when they were building them. It was a very secretive project. The Ford obviously went down this road to, to go back and win Le Mans, which they did. But there were several different routes they could have gone with the engine in this car. They did go with a three and a half liter EcoBoost engine. It does use the same block as an F-150 pickup truck. It's an iron block engine. Of course, it has much larger turbochargers. It has a different intake manifold, some other tuning. But I feel as though the guys that designed that EcoBoost engine in the F-150 truck may take some special pride knowing that their that their iron block anchors this car. And there you can see the active arrow on the Ford GT working as well. Yeah, they, that's about the only thing that this car has in, in <laughs> yeah. common with the Ford F-150, right? We'll be right back with more of the American Speed Festival from Pontiac, Michigan's M1 Concourse right after this. Welcome back to Speed Sports coverage in the American Speed Festival from the M1 Concourse in Pontiac, Michigan. Ralph Shaheen, Brian Loans, Nate Dreyer, and Hannah Lopa. We're all standing up, sitting down, doing different things, shaking the legs a little bit 
getting a hair up on our arms because the open wheel stuff is coming. The engines are alive and we've got some really unique cars coming in this next group. Hi, I'm uh, Chuck Jones. Uh, I'm the owner of the Vels Parnelli Jones VPJ1 behind me. There are some unique attributes to it. Uh, one is uh, the fact that the car has dihedral wings. Uh, early in the era when IndyCars were first beginning to think about aerodynamics, and the designer, a gentleman by the name of Maurice Philippe, had just come over from Lotus and uh, really was intrigued by what uh, uh, the aerodynamic properties uh, that, that IndyCar racing afforded. And he came up with an idea that was uh, totally unique, which was to try to balance straightaway drag against uh, cornering uh, speed. And the purpose of the dihedrals are not so much for downforce, they're actually to load the inside of the car. So the idea being that as the car comes down the straightaway and then begins to arc in the turn, the inside dihedral blanks to the airflow and loads the left-hand side of the car, thus putting a bit more weight uh, to the inside of the car. And here is the Joe Leonard Bells Parnelli Jones entry. Al Unser Sr., Mario Andretti, Joe Leonard drove the three different cars. Viceroy paint schemes for Big Al and, and Mario, and then the Samsonite special for Joe. And they've had it restored to how the car was built and ran in the early part of the month of May, in the early practice sessions that year. Because by the time the race actually came around, those dihedrals were off the car. They right. were running a traditional rear wing. The rules in the middle of the month changed. When you came into the year, USAC had the rules set up in terms of aerodynamics where you had to have the wings as essentially part of the body, part of the chassis of the car, a, a, an integral part of that design. Just a legendary design for a car that actually never took the green with that design. One of the most unique race cars in the history of IndyCar competition. Turbine is another one, and that is out on the race course as well. Let's listen to it here. There you go, you can hear it there. Yeah, absolutely. But it sounds like Nate's Learjet. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Absolutely, for sure. But as I mentioned, you have a lot of the other cars which were maybe much more lightweight, lower on power that were designed more also the aerodynamics coming in to race around the corners more and to be quicker. This was a car that would blast down the straightaway, have to get off the throttle more in the corners, but still was multiple seconds a lot of times faster despite that. But this was, you know, the 68 version of these turbine cars different from 67 in the sense that USAC changed the rules to, to reduce the inlet size to allow air into the turbine. And just like any engine that burns fuel, the less air you have in theory, the less horsepower you can make. My understanding, Nate, is these things still made about 500 horsepower even with the reduction in their inlets. Yeah, still so powerful and also a much different car in terms of the way that they were forced to race. This is Seb Coppola right here in the Lola T192 F5000 from 1970. It's the first successful monocoque that was built by Lola. Of course, Eric Broadley did the design. The car was raced professionally in 1971 and 72 with several top 10 finishes. More to come from the M1 Concourse right after these ones. Welcome back. We're here at the American Speed Festival in M1 Concourse. Ralph Sheen, Brian Loans, Nate Dyer all here with us. Hannah Lopa is joining us as well. And we're getting set to take a look and certainly hear some of NASCAR's big, powerful cup machines in action. And Hannah, that's going to be a lot of fun next. 
Ralph, these stock cars are getting ready to hit the track. I don't know if you can see behind me. Oh, but it looks like they're pushing him back right now. The number two 2012 Penske Dodge driven by Brad Kozlowski here today. They actually won the Penske team in 2012, the NASCAR Cup Series Championship. So an iconic car in racing, and there are so many other exciting cars in this class. I'm really looking forward to seeing them take some laps. Looks like you just need to be push started, Hannah. Old school, baby. They got to run down comes. the hill, and here it comes. cubic inches of the angriest engine you'll hear pretty much all day out here. That's going to wake up the neighborhood. And there's a neighborhood around here, too. <laughs> Brad Kay and the long line of Miller-backed entries that ran for Penske. Yeah, Bill Kittle uh, owns and drives this car this weekend, and we mentioned, or Hannah mentioned, the fact that this was the 2012 championship car, and, or one of them, as we know, especially in this era oh, of NASCAR, yeah. they had, it was a they lot had of chassis them. for every different type of racetrack. And surface. Yes. Right? I mean, when you, you know, cement, guys are making basically what they would call a cement track car for when we're going to Dover. Yeah. You know, that type of deal. Uh, yeah, certainly. You would have your short track car, your intermediate car, your super speedway car road course car, and you had to have more than one of each of those because you had to have a backup for each of them as well, right? They tend to use them too. <laughs> they and use them a lot, big time, big time. And well, look at this, the Hudson Hornet is getting ready to maybe make some laps, and how cool is that? Hannah, you gonna jump in and go for a ride? I would love to jump in and go for a ride, but right now Brian Sowers is the son of the owner of this vehicle. What can you tell me about it? Yeah, so this is actually uh, belongs to Al Schultz. My dad, Ed Sowers, had it for a long time. Jack Miller, who used to curate the Ypsilanti Automotive Heritage Museum, spent a lot of time there. Uh, but the last couple years, it's been gone through again, uh, and it's just a really fun car to bring out to a day like this today. Now, there's a lot of history and racing behind this car. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Yeah, so just that Herb Thomas himself actually uh, was behind the wheel of this car for some pretty epic years for Hudson uh, in the six cylinder, really just kind of uh, making that name that made uh, a brand for itself in the Cars movie and Disney that my boys and my kids enjoy. So uh, all that history in that movie is true to this car uh, and happened in the 50s, which is pretty awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brian. We won't keep you any longer, let you hit the track. Of course, Herb Thomas, a legend in NASCAR competition, won the NASCAR title. Wasn't called the cup title back then, but he won the NASCAR title in 1951 and 53. And, and from what I've been able to find out, Brian, this is the sole surviving authenticated fabulous Hudson Hornet. It that is. We know of. It is, yeah. And, and the lineage of these cars, especially early stock cars, is so difficult to trace because a lot of times, if the car wasn't destroyed in racing, they would actually be sold off and sometimes put back on the street. And if you think that Brad Keselowski car is tough to negotiate around this circuit, <laughs> try driving this baby. It is almost unfathomable to believe that these cars, the Hudson Hornets, dominated NASCAR competition in the early 1950s. It wasn't even a contest. All done with a flathead straight six engine. You rolled into the garage area with one of these, you were bad to yeah. the bone that day. You'll see the words Twin H Power on the hood of this car, and Twin H Power was a an optional package from Hudson. It, it added a carburetor, so the, the car was rated at 145 horsepower stock. If you added the Twin H option, you got a second one-barrel carburetor, which brought it to 160 horsepower, all made before 4,000 RPM. But the real hot ticket in the racing package for this car was called the 7X engine. And when you ordered that 7X engine, you bought the car, ordered the engine, they then sent the engine to the dealer, and they installed the motor. And this was a package that was developed with Marshall Teague and Vince Piggins, as well as with Smokey Eunuch. A larger bore, bigger valves, they relieved the block. You had polished combustion chambers, a high compression cylinder head, split manifolds and dual carburetors, and now we're talking about a 230 horsepower engine. Well, when you talk about containment seats in today's <laughs> modern stock car world, this containment seat would be basically for a family of three across right, right, the bench right. seat in the front. Right, it was the containment doors that this yes. had. <laughs> You mentioned a family of three. Well, the car was ready for a family of three right away because this is a car that was sold back into the public in 1954, changed ownership hands before being restored. So an incredible story there. Speed Sport will be right back to M1 Concourse in Pontiac, Michigan for more of the American Speed Festival after these words.
The American Speed Festival on Speed Sport is brought to you by Maker's Mark, meticulously crafted bourbon, and by Tito's Handmade Vodka. I'm Hannah Lopa, and I'm here with a very special guest, Al Dean, who's participating in the events here at the M1 Concourse this weekend. He does happen to be a garage owner as well, but right now we're at a very special garage that he will also be helping host for this weekend's event. Tell us a little bit about what makes this garage so special. Yeah, well, the M1 uh, Concourse is a great platform that you have both the garages and the track where you can have both performance driving and the show vehicles or the people that like the classic cars. So I have a friend that has a couple of garages here, and uh, he has a garage on the other side of the track that he decorated, and is kind of a man cave and has the racers that we take on the track. Those cars are a little dirtier, but this garage is unique because his wife designed it, and this garage is really what I kind of call the museum and it's really set up for uh, friends and family and some great entertainment with a great view of the performance track out here. So it's kind of a unique uh, garage with some very personal touches for the, for the couple. What are some of those personal touches? Well, we'll take a quick tour, but um, there's one uh, side of the walls here that um, uh, his wife really wanted the cars to come home to a village street and then on the walls, each garage uh, has a number that has some uh, meaning to their relationship and really wanted each car to kind of come home to its own garage. So you'll see in the decorations here, it's pretty cool. Now tell us a little bit about some of the vehicles that are being housed in this garage. Well, this is mainly modern cars. Um, the collector likes to look for low volume cars. These are what I would call museum quality type cars. Each car has a story or is very unique, but um, he was an automotive ex executive that's just recently retired, and he wanted to kind of honor all of our customers that we deal with in the auto industry. So it's not just a Ford garage or a Chevy or a Toyota, but he has uh, basically unique cars from all major OEMs around the world. Now behind you, we have this Dodge Viper tribute car. Elaborate a little bit about what makes this car significant and why it's here this weekend. Yeah, well, there's a couple of cars here that you'd call tribute cars. They're as close to a race car as you can have maybe as uh, buying a, a, an OEM car and then dressing it up to look like a real racer. So this one is actually a Viper ACR. And uh, the tribute was basically for the, the CEO that uh, owns this garage. Uh, the company sponsored racing back in 2015 and uh, won four of the most uh, prestigious endurance races. So this car has basically got uh, the medallions, so the champion medallions of that. And it was in uh, the corporate uh, headquarter lobby for the employees and um, uh, fans to, to appreciate. So. Now there's a very special car at the front of this garage here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Ah, well we got Eleanor. Eleanor is always a fan favorite uh, whenever there's a hospitality or an event here at uh, M1 Concourse. And if you're uh, familiar with Gone in 60 Seconds, you know about Eleanor being uh, a famous uh, uh, car that was in the series with Angelina Jolie and Nicolas Cage. And uh, this one is a, is a real uh, replica uh, that's licensed from the Gone in 60 Seconds movie. Well, Al, thank you so much for showing us around and enjoy your time out on the track. Thanks. I'm really looking forward to it. I've been over in the paddock area. There are some fantastic vintage racers here. I just hope Michigan weather cooperates for us, but it should be a very exciting next two days. It's looking to be a beautiful weekend. We'll be right back with more of the American Speed Festival from Pontiac, Michigan's M1 Concourse right after this. We are back here at the M1 Concourse, more of the American Speed Festival. Hi everybody, Ralph Shaheen, Brian Loans, and Nate Dreyer with us, and we've been joined by an old friend <laughs> and a legend on the racetrack and in the broadcast booth, our good buddy David Hobbs. How are you? <laughs> Legend, I'm still sort of looking over my shoulder. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's good. Um, I haven't been on one of these headsets now for about four years, so yep, it's good to be back. And uh, I tell you what, it's a splendid day for motorsports event. An amazing uh, selection of cars here, and uh, obviously to be working with you again, Ralph, after <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> yes, so, anyway, it has and, been. Uh, yes, we've so, shared many a microphone together. So, as you've seen this for the first first time, uh, what has really stood out to you? Is there a particular car that you've seen that really uh, got your attention, or just the overall event itself? I mean, it's a pretty damned impressive place when you get here. 
I mean, you just can't believe how many garages there are here and this lovely little track. But there are some amazing cars here, and there's a lot of them too. I mean, some of the, some of the ones I drove are here for a first event, it's tremendous. Well, David, here, right here is a car I know you know very well, uh, the Group 44 Jaguar, which to me, uh, I always thought was one of the most beautiful IMSA cars ever. I think you're right. It, it really, really got everybody's imagination going overdrive. This was a terrific car, and it was a great car to drive. And I drove uh, one of these cars at the Daytona 24 hour race in 1984, and we were leading with myself and Bill Adam and Scott uh, Bundy, and quite comfortably, and we had a, a pulley, uh, a, a, a belt came off. Unfortunately, to change the belt, you had to move the whole engine and gearbox, and obviously therefore rear suspension back a couple of inches, put the new pulley on, and off we went. Well, we still came third. So I think it's pretty clear that without that, we obviously could have won that race pretty easily. So it was a great car to drive, but I think they could have put a, uh, knowing, this, knowing this belt came off, I would have thought they could have had some sort of hatch in the bulkhead. But it may be putting a hatch in there would compromise the strength of that bulkhead. Yeah. So I don't know, but anyway, it was a lovely looking car. Brian yeah. Redmond drove this a lot. Yeah. Obviously, as did Bob Tullius, who's the owner of the group, and they had a lot of success. Beautiful Lola. We talked before about the squared off back of some of the cars we've seen. The Lola yeah. has that kind of bevel cut, if you will, in the back, just like the Daytona Goose would have had. These are defining cars. We look back at, at the movies that were made in the yeah. 1960s, Le Mans and others, and this is what people across the world saw and then lusted after and what we do too today. And it's one of the things that car owners of that era loved the Lola T7 because it was a fast race car. It was a reliable and sturdy race car, and it was fairly easy to manage budget-wise with this race car. It wasn't hard to buy one compared to some of the other machines that it would have been racing against, but because it was so easy to maintain, it wasn't very expensive to maintain as well. Well, like all endurance cars over the course of an event, they need to be serviced and changed. And one of the things that people enjoyed about these cars were they are effectively built to be taken apart quickly to some degree to make as many uh, repairs as needed to be to get it back on course. Exactly. Not just that, but when you think about what Lola did year to year in terms of being able to upgrade the car from the Mark 1 to the Mark 2, and this is the Mark 3 of the Lola T70, they made massive changes. In fact, between the 1968 and this, which is the 1969 version, you're looking at Lola coming in with a new aluminum monocoque chassis that wasn't on the car before, a new engine and transmission combination as well. So year after year, the car, because it was simple and you could do those things, was able to have massive changes year after year. I mean, this is still a Lola T70. It's a Mark III, but the Mark III almost should have been a new car yeah. from beyond <laughs> the, the Mark II T70. Yeah, where they began in the middle 60s to where they ended up in the late 60s, early 70s, really worked worlds apart. They manufactured over 100 of these cars over the course of their run, which in sports car manufacturing uh, is big numbers. Here's Kip right here. He just uh, bringing his Cobra to his stop, Hannah, and Kip is grinning ear to ear as you would expect a man who drives a, an original Cobra to do. Definitely can't say I blame him. Big smile on his face. Kip, tell us a little bit about this beautiful Cobra. Uh, 427 car, built in 1966. Um, was born a 427. Um, now done in SC trim, which would be the roll hoop and a little wider flare in the hood scoop. But um, been in the collection. Have We've had this car for 36 years for the first owner. Then we purchased the car from him. So the car is actually still in the collection with a different collection that I'm involved in. So this car has been around for a very long time. Now you've got several other cars here this weekend, one of them being the McLaren. Tell us a little bit about that magnificent car. Yeah, that's a beautiful car. That car didn't get any track time um, or see any track service this weekend, but that's one of only two that was done in the United States in um, Kingfisher Blue. It's a really unique color. It's kind of a throwback to the original colors from McLaren and their racing. Even a little bit of orange on there to kind of bring back the Can-Am era for, from McLaren, of course. Yeah, great car. Now, I know you said it didn't get any track time, but are you going to let me take it out for a few laps after the track <laughs> shuts down today? What do you say? Absolutely. <laughs> Love to hear it. Thank you so much, Kip Sheward. Well done, Hannah. Can't blame you for asking about that. 
Kids having a great day. You got the McLaren Center parked over there, and you're driving the, an original big block 427 Cobra. My man's living right. Yeah. And, you know, the 427 Ford and that entire FE family of engines is one of the most unique engine families when it comes to motorsports competition in America. And that 427 high-riser engine that would have been found in the cars like the Ford Thunderbolt and, and in the cars like the Shelby Cobra became a dominating force in racing. Well, there's more track activity yet to go here at the American Speed Festival. Stay with us. We're coming right back for a lot more fun, furious action here at M1 Concourse. Welcome back to more of Speed Sports coverage at the American Speed Festival. I'm Ralph Shingeen. Nate Dreyer is here with us. He's shifted over here into the middle a little bit. Brian Loans is here still with us. And Rick Noop Hi. has joined us. Rick, it's great to see you. And based on the shirt, I know you're awful busy here at M1 Concourse. It says instructor. You're right. teaching guys a lot about how to go fast, aren't you? Oh, we're having a blast here. Uh, whenever Johnny O'Connell doesn't want uh, a particular weekend, <laughs> All of a sudden, I know, give it to Mikey. So I was the Mikey. <laughs> I've been coming here uh, about the last four months and to watch this beautiful building on the left come up. And as you know, we had the uh, Motorsports Hall of Fame. Yes. Getting to talk with uh, Marty Reed and Bobby Allison, Judy Stropas, who timed yep, me a lot yep, in the yeah. day when yep. Amazing we woman. were. Sure. And uh, yeah. I basically have been also teaching in California. But this particular track has some topography. It, it, it has a little bit of rises, a little bit of Laguna Seca into it. Uh, even though it's a 1.5 mile track, it mixes some sheer speed in the index of performance or power to weight. And with the weather that we get here, I'm still based in California, uh, around March and April, rain or shine. And as you know, being a road racer, rain or shine. <laughs> That's right. So we see the 1901 Ford sweepstakes coming onto the racetrack right now. This is uh, obviously by far the oldest thing we have here, a 120-year-old car. This is a, a nut and bolt recreation of the original sweepstakes car that really uh, saved Henry Ford's bacon for a short amount of time in 1901. He went broke again, but this one put him back on the map when he beat up on Winton. Yeah, that pretty much gave him the opportunity and the funding to go forward. Now, Rick, have you ever driven anything <laughs> close to that? Uh, a D4 tractor when I was about eight <laughs> years old and a 1941 Diamond T, but you're ahead of me on this one, Ralph. As a guy who won a race, a six-hour race in an AMC Concord, <laughs> yes, sir. That that thing might not have been much more advanced. Than no, that. he's right. We're getting closer. Yes. Well, let's exactly. listen to this just for a second because it, it, when it when it's going, it makes a very different sound. That chuck it a chuck it a noise you're hearing from the engine. That is a horizontally opposed two-cylinder engine that displaces 538 cubic inches. Oh my a god. A seven-inch bore and a seven-inch stroke. It makes 26 horsepower at 900 RPM. You mentioned the tractor, that's pretty much where the tractor was there, at too. There you go. Love it. Lots more great stuff coming your way for the American Speed Festival. Here we are here at the M1 Concourse in Pontiac, Michigan. Ralph Shaheen, Brian Loans, Nate Dreyer, and Hannah Lopa with you. Take a walk down through some of these cars, Nate. Is that March 817 right there owned by Paul Newvin, driven by the likes of Bobby Rahal and Al Hunter. And this is a car from the late era of the Can-Am series. You'll see some of the development that we've talked about, but this is a much different era later than that Pernelli Jones machine you mentioned a moment ago. The Meek of Jones car, and here comes the Shadow. You know, the manufacturer Shadow came in. They won the final of the traditional Can-Am titles back in 1974, but it is gonna be time for some small block and big block Chevy horsepower out here now. My name is Bob Lee. Uh, I'm the owner of the TI-22 Mark II. I was first interested in this car when I read Pete Lyon's book on the Can-Am. Uh, what really interested me was the fact that this car challenged the dominant McLarens. Uh, when it came out, this is the second titanium car that Peter Bryant designed. The first one crashed 
first one, the Mark I, crashed at St. Jovite, and they had started designing this Mark II, and they quickly finished the design in four months. They took it to Laguna Seca, and they finished second, set the fastest race lap. Uh, McLaren won the race. In, uh, two weeks later, they went to Riverside. They finished second and set the fastest race lap. And then, unfortunately, the team ran out of money and the company went bankrupt. The car was put back together by a, a fantastic group of talented craftsmen called the Surfers, Tom Job and Bob Skinner. And David Hobbs took this car in 1971. It was already a one-year-old car, and he was on the second row. So what interested me was this car showed great potential. I love the Can-Am, and I always thought this was a very interesting car. I knew that the third owner had crashed at Riverside and the car had burned to the ground. But I, and I wanted to, rest to, to restore the car if there was still a chassis. I found out there wasn't, it went to the dump. So I thought, if I can buy the rights to the car, the rights to the history, and the original design documents, I, I would undertake recreating the car. When you read back in the history of this car, it should have cost them almost a half a million dollars. For the amount of titanium used to construct this car at the time, it was about a half a million dollars. But they paid 16 grand. Wow. Yeah. You talk about publicity, we talked about Paul Newman earlier. This car was featured in the 1970 movie, Once Upon a Wheel. It was yeah. a, essentially a made-for-TV racing documentary by Paul Newman, so a car that has a big uh, place in helping tell the history of racing as well uh, in terms of that early 1970s TV doc. You know, we talk a lot about this car because of the Titan, but you know, it's also the first car to use side fences to help channel airflow uh, over the body to help increase the downforce. So. Not only were they creative with the materials that they used to build it, but then once they were shaping it, they got very creative there as well. This car came in about 120 pounds lighter than pretty much anything else on the grid because of the fact it was tight to end to end. But it does have an 8-liter big block Chevy in it, so a 494-inch uh, combination there. These cars started with 427s, and then Reynolds Aluminum was uh, the actual company that the GM went through to make the aluminum blocks. But there are a scant few of those original 494-inch tall deck aluminum blocks still out there. This is one of them. Really cool looking car. And this car right here, this is the John Meekham Barnelli Jones car. And it is almost unfair to call it the Barnelli Jones car because he made one start in it. But what a notable start it was. Absolutely. What an incredible story. So this is a car that has a history as both running a Chevy, a Chevy small block V8 as well as a Ford engine. Well, they showed up to Laguna Seca to run with that Ford engine, but they were having issues all weekend long getting that engine to run right. Uh, went through a couple of them that they had had expire through practice. So, John Meekham and the team went to Roger Penske, who obviously had a ton of Chevy engines. They borrowed one of those Chevy engines from the Penske team, and Parnelli Jones went out and won one of the heat races with that engine put in. Now remember, it isn't as simple as just bolting a new engine in. The entire car would have been designed around that Ford Westlake design in the first place, so now you have a completely different weight, completely different setup to that car, and somehow Jones still went out with that completely different engine in and won at Laguna Seca, which at that time was one of the most trying tracks in all of North America and all of the world when you think of the old layout that was essentially bypassing that inner part of the track that they run through today. And this was late in Barnelli Jones' career. You know, a lot of people forget he hung it up in the early 70s as far as a driver would go on to be a successful team owner and an innovator in, in, in other respects of racing. But, um, you know, Jones, I think, almost more than anybody you talk about, a Joe Leonard type, whatever, but Barnelli Jones drove with grit and will and a level of just... I, I don't even know the correct phrase other than badassery to, yeah, to go well, out there and just and just beat stuff to death. That's a good that's a yeah. good way of putting it when you talk about PJ. But you know the thing about it is he got out too soon. He got focused on his business career and you wonder had he stayed in even longer, how much more he would have added to the Hall of Fame list that he had already stacked on his resume. Sit back and listen, boys, because this sounds real good to me. The American Speed Festival on Speed Sport has been brought to you by Champion. Over 100 years of performance. By Lexus. Experience amazing. And by Dodge. Horsepower is our superpower.
Welcome back to Speed Sports coverage of the American Speed Festival from the M1 Concourse. Brilliant day, and you know, as we continue to work our way through these initial groups, we have three V3 pinnacle cars of the event about ready to make their way out right now, and I think it's only appropriate we mention the name Jim Hall and certainly the Chaparrales. We're going to see the three, the two, the two E, and the two F. This is really what the American Speed Festival is all about. That the 2F, the enclosed car with the very coarse high wing, foot operated by the driver. That is an aluminum 427 inch big block Chevy in the back of it. And it was the best kind of the evolution, if you will, the step ahead of the, the 2E, which is an open cockpit car. But this is different because of the fact it is a fiberglass car. Yeah, and you did mention taking a step back as well, talking about that rear wing being foot operated. Well, that left foot is open to be able to work that wing because these cars ran an automatic transmission that Chaparral uh, developed with the original two that we'll look at as well. But something that was well known to these machines that they ran that automatic, we'll call it essentially an so, automatic transmission. The driver didn't have to operate and use the clutch that left that left foot open and allowed for them to be able to operate that rear wing. This car weighs 1,750 pounds. About 600 pounds less than the Ford Mark IV that it was battling with back in the day. 427 cubic inch big block, as you mentioned, in that fiberglass chassis. 2F found, won the final race of the 1967 season at Brands Hatch, full field of Ferrari, Fords, Porsches, on and on and on that year. And it was probably banned from competition right. at that moment. <laughs> as Jim Hall became unfortunately familiar with many times. This is the 2E, the open cockpit car. The original driver in this car was Phil Hill, first ever American world champion. Sam Posey has a great quote about the first time he saw this car pull into a racetrack on the back of a trailer. He said, everybody just stopped what they were doing, basically dropped the tools. They looked at it and they said, this is gonna change the world. And it did in so many different ways. We can pick about a hundred elements of this car that really influence cars that are still being built to this point. Good afternoon, I'm Jim Hall II. I'm at M1 Concourse in Michigan, uh, Pontiac, Michigan, having a great time with three iconic uh, chaparrales from the mid-1960s. So we talked about the aerodynamic balance that we're able to do with an active rear wing. They, they now use this in Formula One, but we balance the whole car with an active front and rear wing and we can look down here and the foot pedal actually move this one. And at the same time, the foot pedal moves the rear wing and you can see it be activated here. So on the straightaway, braking for the corners and accelerating then back to trim out on the straightaway. Pretty cool design. <laughs> of course outlawed, but Still fun. Well, we talked about a Chaparral that was all dominating. We've seen two, two great cars, but really it is the Chaparral 2, the car we're looking at now, that began to develop some of the concepts that would lead to the 2E and the 2F. This is the car that effectively conquered the world in the, in the middle 1960s with Jim driving it. It established him as one of the great race car drivers of his generation and certainly established Chaparral as one of the great builders and, and innovators. Right, this car really acting as the starting point. When you look at this car's history and career uh, between 1963 and 1965, those seasons, how about a car and a, a design that won 22 of 39 international world-class races it entered? When you think about when it, just looking at the top competition races, 39 times it entered, over half of those races, 22 times, this car won. And it really shows it was the proof being in the pudding of what they were able to come up with and then all the wild designs that came off of it. But this really, truly the starting point, 1964, kind of halfway through the history of this car, you see that automatic transmission developed. So all these things that became so revolutionary became revolutionary because the car had so much success on track. This was just a glimpse of what day one was all about at the first ever American Speed Festival in Pontiac, Michigan at the M1 Concourse. Make sure to tune in back here for coverage of day two, December 2nd at 7 p.m. Eastern. 
Also, mark your calendars for next year's event, September 29th through October 2nd, 2022. Next year, it's going to be a celebration of the 60th anniversary of Shelby American. For Hanalopa, Nate Dreyer and Ralph Shaheen, I'm Brian Loans. We'll see you again soon.